building on Holt's linear trend method, Charles Holt and his student uh, Peter Winters extend Holt's linear trend method to also account for seasonality. So let's have a look at this method in this section. Here are the equations for Holt's linear trend method. If we've got seasonality, we want to include components, we need to include parts that will account for seasonality. Hence, what they do is add a seasonal index, a seasonal component to the forecast equation, where S is indexed by this T plus H minus M times K plus one, which looks um, quite congested, but it is very simple. It basically takes the last seasonal component you see for the corresponding seasonal period. Then in the level equation, what we do is we seasonally adjust the data we see by that seasonal component. And basically we add a third smoothing equation to account for the seasonal component. Now this seasonal component is a weighted average, again, a convex combination of the current seasonal estimate. So YT minus the level plus trend plus the linear combination of that with the last estimated seasonal component we've seen. So T minus M. Now we have the, the parameters we need to estimate for this method now are the three smoothing coefficients, the two that we had before, alpha and vita star. Now we have gamma, which is a smoothing coefficient for the seasonal component. And we also have initial state for level and trend, but now we have, because we have with quarterly data, we have four seasonal indices. We need to start these somewhere. Okay, so here's the official slide, which repeats what I just said before. So we have the forecast equation with the three smoothing equations. Um, again, this K integer is, this K is the integer part of H minus M plus M, H minus one plus, divided by M, sorry. We saw this in the seasonal naive, um, uh, forecast method, which you saw in earlier sections of the book. Um, now the parameter restrictions or the, the bound restrictions for the smoothing parameters as before alpha is and vita are between zero and one. But now gamma is between zero and one minus alpha. And M again depicts as we have throughout the book, the period of the seasonality for quarterly data M is equal to four. And that's what we base this example on. Now, let me talk a little bit about this gamma smoothing coefficient. Traditionally, the way Holt and Winters had presented the method was using this equation. Now, just taking this and reparameterizing it a little bit, we end up with, um, with getting this equation here where gamma is equal to gamma star one minus alpha where gamma star is the original parameter. And hence, if gamma star is between zero and one, as originally depicted by Holt and Winters, this translates into gamma being between zero and one minus alpha. Now, the reason we do this, as you'll see in later section of the book, is that it helps us conveniently write these states as part of, as a function of past states, rather than in this original equation, sorry, in this original equation where ST is part is a function of a current state LT. And you'll see where that comes handy um, in subsequent section of the textbook when we start talking about models that we build underlying these uh, exponential smoothing methods. Bit of an animation, let's have a look of an example. This is Medicare Australia cost of vaccine scripts data with high, quite high seasonality. So the blue uh, line here is a seasonal component. The black line is um, the actual data. So just a bit of notation here. When gamma is equal to zero, we have no change. And the hence gamma here, we start the animation with gamma is equal to zero. So no change in the smoothing, in the seasonal component. When gamma is equal to one, then we have seasonal naive, when gamma is close to being one is we have close to seasonal naive. Um, usually we see a, um, a gamma quite low, so seasonal component doesn't change immensely. So usually below 0.2, but sometimes it might not be. So let's have a look at the effect of gamma increasing and the effect on the seasonal component. So you can see as gamma increases, the seasonal component changes quite a bit. If we let the animation run, um, 
as gamma gets higher, you see that the seasonal component adjusts very quickly to account for the previous seasonality it sees. And when gamma goes close to one or gamma is equal to 0.99, then we have the seasonal naive. So the seasonal component actually very closely follows what it sees in the previous period. Um, for this method and for this data set, the optimal, um, we estimate the method, and we'll talk about estimation soon, um, and gamma is equal to 0.72, which is quite high, but you can see why it is quite high, because the seasonal component in this data set changes quite rapidly, and the red and the green line are the two extremes where we have zero or one. Now, an alternative um, to the Holt-Winters additive method is where we have our level and our trend interacting with a seasonal component in a multiplicative way. Hence, now a seasonal component, instead of detraining, our, uh, sorry, deseasonalizing and dating by subtracting the seasonal component, we divide through the seasonal component. Here, when we um, detrend our data, instead of subtracting the trend and the level, we are dividing through, so it can leave us a multiplicative seasonal component. Um, K is again the same. Um, integer part of H minus one divided by M. So again, it selects the last seasonal period that we've estimated and we use that seasonal component, uh, seasonal index. Um, the thing to note here is that with an additive method, ST in absolute uh, terms is close to the sum of, of the seasonal indices within a year is equal to zero, or close to zero, approximately equal to zero. With a multiplicative method, um, the S is in relative terms, and within each year, the sum of these S's is equal to M, the seasonal period. Let's have a look at an example so we can sort of explore these with a data set. We're going to take the tourism table and use the holiday series, and we want to uh, forecast the Australian holidays, the aggregate of these, using two methods. We're going to use the additive Holt-Winters method and the multiplicative Holt-Winters method. Now, the, the, the function we use here again is the ETS function, which we will talk in detail in the next couple of sections of the book. Uh, the way we define these, the way we, we um, define this in the ETS function is to choose the error term as additive, 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 additive trend, additive seasonality. For the multiplicative method, we're going to choose it it combines well, it, it, it matches well, where your error process is a multiplicative, a trend is additive, and your seasonal component is multiplicative. So once we take, once we estimate those models, we're going to uh, generate some forecasts. Let's have a look at some uh, estimation outputs. Here we have the two models. We use the tidy function to have a look at the two models. Uh, two methods, sorry. The first column here is the additive hot winters. The second column is the multiplicative hot winters. Not much difference in the smoothing coefficients. Alpha, Vita, sorry, Alpha, Vita, and Gamma. We have the initial state of B0 here and L0. The thing that I want to draw your attention to is the seasonal component, the difference between an additive seasonal component and a multiplicative seasonal component. So absolute seasonality, relative seasonality. So the, the indices here, so the data finishes at Q4. So going back in time, we're, go, we're gonna estimate um, the minus S minus three, S minus two, S minus one as zero. So you start at S zero, um, estimating Q4, Q3, Q2, and Q1. Notice the difference in scale that these seasonal components add up to zero and they vary in, in Absolute terms, these seasonal um, indices uh, sum up to one and they vary in relative terms. Uh, we can use the components function and print out the actual components, the estimated components. And I'm also left joining the estimated components with the fitted values just to have a bit of a comparison. So basically here, if we take the first fitted value Okay, yt plus one condition on t, that is equal to lt plus bt plus st minus three. Okay, this is for quarterly data. In the multiplicative method case, 
our first fitted value is equal to LT plus BT times the seasonal index. We can plot these out. Um, the interesting, I guess the, the level and the slope components are fairly similar, a bit of variation between them. But the big difference again is the difference in um, the seasonal component, additive on the left, multiplicative on the right, um, and of course the remainder. Okay. Let's have a look at some forecasts using these two methods. The orange forecasts here are, come from the additive model. The blue forecasts come from the multiplicative uh, method. And hence, we see that the uh, multiplicative method does a better job in sort of uh, um, expanding the seasonality as it projects forward. So the, the forecasts are wider, if you want, in the seasonal component compared to uh, the additive, uh, the forecasts that come from the additive method. Old Winter's Additive Method. Okay, um, this is probably one um, tool that you, every forecaster should have in their tool bag if they're forecasting uh, seasonal data and they're using exponential smoothing. So this is a combination of having Holt Winter's season and seasonal method, multiplicative Holt Winter's seasonal method with uh, a damped trend. So anecdotal evidence um, tells us that in practice, in a lot of consulting work, this method is used very, very um, oftenly and it performs extremely, extremely well. So again, it's a combination of uh, damn trend additive with multiplicative seasonal uh, component. So as you can see, the equations as we're building these and we interacting these components differently um, they have got the same form is just making sure that you interact these components in the right way okay let's have a look at another example just uh, for the application of this method um, this is the pedestrian symbol data um, for the the actually sensors around Melbourne that count for the number of people that go through that sensor. We've pulled out the Southern Cross station, which is a train station, a main train station in, in Melbourne. Um, and let's have a look at some, this is daily data. Let's have a look at some data and some forecasts just to um, reiterate here for this hot winters damped trend multiplicative method. Uh, we're going to use, we're going to um, combine uh, the error and the seasonal being M, and now our trend component is an additive damp trend. So here's the data. So um, this is daily data, hence the uh, troughs down here are weekends, the peaks are on weekdays, and um, the we forecast the last two weeks, and the blue things are here. The blue um, lines here are our, are our forecasts. And hence, we see that um, it does these do pretty well in generating forecasts for this type of data. I will make a comment about the prediction intervals here. We see that we get wider prediction intervals or more uncertainty during um, the weekdays in contrast to the weekends. Now, we have not spoken until now how we generate these prediction intervals because all you've seen, if you go back to this, to this. Uh, the last uh, sort of method that we see is just some formula that can give you some forecasts. We have not spoken how we're going to generate these prediction intervals. Well, we'll do that next in the book. <laughs>